You're a Georgia resident and voting day keeps getting closer. For months, you've studied the issues and researched each candidate. Now, you're ready to head to the polls and vote. The only question is how. First, you need to register to vote. You can fill out an online form, print a form and mail it to the Georgia Secretary of State, register when you renew your driver's license, or fill out a form at your local public library or school. Once you've registered, you'll get your precinct card in the mail. This lists your exact polling location. You can also find out where to vote and see a sample ballot by logging into My Voter page on the Secretary of State website. If you're not sure whether or not you're registered, use this website to check. Now you're ready for Election Day. All you need to bring with you to the polls is a valid photo ID, such as a driver's license or passport. Polls are typically open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. If you're not available during this time block, you can vote early or send in an absentee ballot. Request an absentee ballot with a form on the Secretary of State website. You can mail, fax, or email the form to your local county Board of Registrar's office. It's safest to send in your ballot at least a few days in advance to make sure it arrives by Election Day. In Georgia, you can vote early without giving a reason. Just contact your county voter registration office or visit the Secretary of State website for the early voting locations and times. And that's it. Pretty simple. Now ready, set, vote! Hi everybody, I'm Youth Minister Casey Bethel. And I'm Deaconess Annie Jackson. You know, Ms. Jackson, one of the things I've been thinking about recently is about how much I've grown during my time here at New Mountaintop. I can agree. My family and I have benefited from Bishop Lipman's preachings and teachings since we've been here. But I bet everybody out there, if they thought about it, have stories just like that, about how Bishop Lipman, through his ministry, has helped them become better people, too. That's why we're here to encourage you to join us for something special we're doing right here at the church. Our church is planning a drive-in worship experience in celebration of Bishop Littman's 14th anniversary. That is correct. This event will be held in the lower parking lot near the administrative building. You can enjoy the service in your car in the comfort so that we can practice social distancing. But just because we're socially distant and safe doesn't mean we won't have fun. It's going to be exciting. Brand new music. Bishop Littman's going to preach a special message, and we're going to praise God for our man of God, October 11th, 9.30, right here at the church. That's right. So please join us. Save the date, October 11th, 9.30 a.m. See you there. Good morning, New Mountaintop. My name is Reverend Melissa, and I'm super excited. I get to do the call of worship with you today. Um, I'm not going to prolong the time, as always, and I'm going to jump right into the Word. So I'm going to be coming out of Mark chapter 2, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 10 through 11, and this is what the Word says. Amen. It says, But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. Amen. I just want you to be encouraged by this scripture, church. I want you to be encouraged because the enemy has sent somebody to talk into your ear. Amen. The enemy has sent somebody to tell you, to make you doubt that the God you serve doesn't have authority. Amen. But I want you to know that the Son of God has authority on earth. Amen. He has the authority to forgive sins. Amen. He has the authority to call those who are dead to rise again in life. Amen. I want you to be encouraged. Amen man, that the God who has authority over the earth knows your name. Amen. And I want you to just get empowered by that, get encouraged by that, and know that he tells you, take up your mat and go home. Amen. I want you to know that you're going to look the enemy right in the face and tell them, I serve a God who has all authority. So all those lies you're telling me, I'm just going to ignore it. Amen. I'm just going to disregard it. Amen. Because I serve a God who has authority. Amen. Church, be encouraged, amen, that God has all power, amen. Oh, New Mountaintop, this is your call to worship. Be blessed. It's time for worship.
has been coming to church for a while now. Amidst the busyness of work and life, he wants to grow closer to the Lord, but he feels like something's missing. He reads his Bible, well, sometimes. He's attending a home group and even listening to podcasts of old sermons. But try as he might, he just feels like something's missing. Then Bob heard a teaching on giving financially. He felt a little convicted, knowing that he and his family were not regularly tithing 10%. But he wondered, does God really command me to give the first 10% to the church? Does the church really even need the money? Oh, what's in it for me? Why should I give? Bob decided to dig a little deeper and look into it for himself. So he opened his Bible and really didn't know where to look. So he Googled Bible passages about money. He was very surprised to find a large number of verses about tithing, and not just in the Old Testament. Jesus himself taught about tithing to the local church. Now Bob was really feeling convicted. He was beginning to see why the tithe was so important. It wasn't about the church needing money or trying to scam him in some way. It was a question of the heart. Bob repented of his disobedience and he started to return the first 10% of his income to God. He was pleasantly surprised to see breakthroughs in many areas of his life. His relationship with his children, his marriage, and even his finances began to improve. Bob thought back to one of the verses that he'd read about the time. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out my blessing upon you. Good in the morning. 
Well, grace and peace and welcome to the Weekend Word. Today we share with you from Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Lord, lead us and feed us as we study your word. Amen. It reads like this, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Amen. I want to talk to you in this message about room temperature religion. Room temperature religion. Be sure to put that on your social media this weekend. Jesus, as he has done with the previous six churches, also with this seventh church, adapts the words of his sayings to signify those important attributes of how the church in that city represents the city that it is in. In this case, Laodicea was known for its wealth. They were known as a 
manufacturing location for special eye salve. As well, they also produced glossy black wool cloth. It was lo located near Hierapolis, where there was a famous hot spring. And also, to its other direction was Colossae, which was known for cold water. The Lord presented himself here as the Amen, signifying in the Old Testament the truth that he is and the truth that he would speak to them. The Lord was about to tell the church at uh, Laodicea some truths that they were not ready to receive, neither were they ready to hear concerning their spiritual condition. And unfortunately, they would not believe the diagnosis of their spiritual x-ray. The church at Laodicea was blind to their own needs and they were unwilling to face and to literally see their issues. The truth of the matter is that when we are caught up in the sin of seeing ourselves better and bigger than we truly are, we too are in need of some eye salve. Because if we want God's best for our life, and even for our church, we have to be honest with God and let God be honest with us. The Bible teaches us, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus addresses this church and the Lord seeks to help them to now see themselves for who they really and truly are. Let's look at this church because there are four areas that Christ indicates and demonstrates that the church of Laodicea had room temperature religion. Number one, they had lost their vigor. They had lost their vigor. In our Christian life, there are three spiritual temperatures. There is a burning heart that's on fire for God, according to Luke 24, 32. There's a cold heart according to Matthew 24 and 12. And then there is a lukewarm heart or room temperature heart, according to Revelations 3, 16. Now the room temperature or lukewarm Christian is a person who is comfortable, complacent, and doesn't even realize that they have a need spiritually. And they may not even feel that they are in the condition than they are. But both the cold water from Colossae and the hot water from Hierapolis would be lukewarm by the time they got it piped all the way to Laodicea. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have every reason to be fervent in spirit, fervent in prayer. It's a vital and essential attribute in our lives as Christians. The disciples at Emmaus, they listened to the word that their hearts became warmed. When you come to church, when you hear God's word, even via technology, if you are receptive to it, it ought to have some heat in your life that causes you to feel life and embrace life and embrace the challenge. Now, we all enjoy beverages either hot or cold, but one that is room temperature is flat and it is stale. That's why at the restaurant, the waiter or server will keep adding hot coffee to your cup or adding water to your cup because it is important to understand in thermodynamics that closed systems eventually turn into no more energy. And when nothing is added from the outside, the entire system will die and or decay. And except we add fuel to our spiritual fire, the hot water in the boiler of our soul becomes cool. Without electricity, the refrigerant in the freezer becomes warm. The church cannot be a closed system. Jesus says in John 15 and five, without me, you can do nothing. The Laodicean church was independent. They were self-satisfied and they were secure. 
They say it in the writings of Revelation here. We have need of nothing. But all the while, their spiritual power had been decaying and their material wealth and glowing statistics were but shrouds hiding a rotten corpse underneath. The Lord was outside the church trying to get in, according to Revelations 3 and 20. They had lost their values in verse 17 and 18. The church of Smyrna thought itself poor when it was really rich. The Laodiceans boasted that they were rich when they were in fact poor. Perhaps we have here a hint of why the church declined spiritually. They had become proud of their ministry, proud of their past, proud of their uh, things that they had accumulated, material possessions that belonged to the church. Yet they had begun to measure things by human standards instead of by spiritual values. They were in the eyes of the Lord wretched and miserable and poor. And that's why he says that in the text. Laodicea was a wealthy city, a banking center. Perhaps some of the, some of the spirit of the marketplace had begun to creep into the church so that their values became twisted. And whenever it is that the ways of the world work their way into the ways of the word or into the church, we too will become room temperature and twisted. Are there things that are more important to you than God? Even in the church, if you think about it, the board at the Laodicean church could proudly show you the latest annual report. The officers could show you impressive statistics. The head of auxiliaries could show you how well that they had done and all that they had achieved. Yet Jesus says, you make me sick to my stomach and all I want to do is vomit you out of my mouth. Well, what was the solution? He says, pay the price to get true gold that has been tried in the fire. What was Jesus saying? He was suggesting that the church needed some persecution, <laughs> that they had become too comfortable. And there's nothing in the world that makes God's people examine their priorities faster than suffering. Perhaps that's the role of COVID-19 to help us to examine our priorities. Now the church at Laodicea had lost their vision as well. The Laodiceans were blind. They could not see reality. They were living a fool's paradise, proud of a church that was about to be rejected. And the apostle Peter teaches that when a believer is not growing in the Lord, his spiritual vision is affected. Diet has a bearing on the condition of one's eyesight in a spiritual sense as well as in a physical one. And these people could, could not see themselves as they really and truly were. Nor could they see their Lord as, they, as he stood outside of the door of the church trying to get in. Nor could they see the open doors of opportunity. They were so wrapped up in building their own kingdom that they had become room temperature religious people in their concern for a lost world. But what was the solution? Apply the heavenly eye salve. You see, the city of Laodicea was noted for its eye salve. But the kind of medication the saints needed was not available in the local grocery store or the local drug store. No physician or pharmacy had this. The eye is one of the body's most sensitive areas. And only the great physician can operate on it and make it what it ought to be. And as Jesus did with the man who was blind in John 9, he might even irritate before he illuminates. But we must submit to his treatment and then maintain good spiritual health habits so that our vision grows keener and keener. They also had lost their vestments, meaning their clothing. These Christians thought that they were clothed in splendor when they were really naked. To be naked meant to be defeated. It meant to be humiliated. 
and the Laodiceans could go to the market and purchase fine woolen garments, but that would not meet their real need. They needed white garments of God's righteousness and God's grace. Now, according to Revelation 19, verse 8, we should be clothed in fine linen, clean and white. And this is merely a symbol of the righteous acts of the saints that is the result of the blood of Jesus Christ covering our sin. You see, salvation means that Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. That means it's put to our account. It's like a transfer when you are low in funds. Christ transferred to our account. But sanctification means that his righteousness is imparted to us, meaning it is made a part of our character and our conduct that when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness as a part of us. And there is no divine commendation to this church. Of course, the Laodiceans were busy commending themselves. They didn't need the Lord to commend them. They thought that they were glorifying God when in reality they were actually disgracing his name just as though they had been walking around naked. Well, the Lord closes this letter with three special statements. First of all, an explanation. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Revelations 3.19a. He still loved this lukewarm room temperature church, even though their love for him had grown cold. Isn't that like him? That he still loves us even when we are not where we're supposed to be. He planned to chasten, that is chastise them as proof of his love for them. God permits churches to go through times of trials so that they might become what he wants them to become. Secondly, there is an exhortation. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Revelation 3.19b. The church at Laodicea had to repent of their pride and humble themselves before the Most High God. That is the only way to know God for who he truly is. Finally, there is an invitation in Revelation 3, verse 20 through 22. We often use those words to lead lost people to Christ, but this basic application is to the believer. You see, the Lord was outside of the Laodicean church and he spoke to them as an individual saying, I'm standing at the door knocking. Any man hear my voice, open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Well, God bless you, my friend. Thank you so much for listening to the word. Let me pray with you very quickly. Lord Jesus, help us to have a heart for you. Thank you for these spiritual x-rays that we've been able to examine our condition. Now, God, work in us and work on us that we may prove to be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends. I'll talk to you all next week.